Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 21st, 2017. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. All right, what we talk about? Well, obviously, if you've never been here before, we talk about current market conditions and your questions on trading. Uh, keep your questions, if you don't mind, Focus to what's on the slides, but then you can ask anything you want, especially when we get the live charts. And then once we do get the live charts, if you want to talk about individual stocks, please do so. Just ask about one stock at a time and hit return. And that's for your benefit, so I know which ones I covered and which ones I didn't. So what are we going to talk about? Well, what are we going to focus on, I should say? I want to talk about from fear to hope and hope to fear. And that's going to make a lot of sense in a few minutes, or at least I hope it does. And then I have a follow-up on a money and position management example, live example there. I guess before we do all that, we need to take a look at the disclaimer screen. I could sum it up really quickly. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. As you may know, I've been working on a psychology course. And I'll probably be working on it for a long, long time. It took me two years to get the Trading Full Circle course out, which was somewhat more basic. But with everything I do, it grew and grew and grew and became a little bit more involved. But as I've said ad nauseum, a few years ago, I started working on a psychology course and ended up with 14-page to-do list. And I decided to scrap it. Well, I'm back on that again. And you'll see over the next probably year or so, you'll probably see a lot of pieces of that find its way into this presentation, such as some of the stuff I'm fleshing out a little bit today. And in the process, what I want to do is I want to give credit what credit is due. So I began searching for original thought, and I found a few old texts. And obviously, I went through Jesse Livermore's Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, which is allegedly about Jesse Livermore. We all know it is. And what's the author of that? Lefer, let me see. It's uh, Edwin Lefebvre. Ferrer. I don't know how you say that. And I'm half French. I should be able to say that. But anyway. And what's kind of interesting is I'm hearing these things and are reading these things from these more contemporary sources. And a lot of the things that I'm reading and I'm trying to give credit where credit is due, I go in and I find that it's not exactly original thought. This was discussed many years ago in the 20s even. And even before that, going back even further, I've got a book that was written in the 1800s that talked about a lot of these things. So it's kind of fascinating. And, and even in Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, Livermore himself said there's nothing new under the sun, which, as you may know, is a quote from the Bible. And without digressing too far, it's kind of interesting that he also went on to say that human nature tends to repeat itself. And if you think about it, that's what makes a market. And actually provides us with opportunities. And every time I reread Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, I tend to pick something up, and uh, I have a, a hard copy here, actually a couple hard copies, but I also have the later version, which was, um, I forget the who redid it, a hedge fund guy or something, redid it with the commentary and all. Just search for it on Amazon, you can find it. And uh, I have the Kindle version of that, which is pretty cool because this is where I get a lot of my quotes from. And one thing that I didn't really think about too much or maybe glossed over in one of my prior readings is when Livermore talked about how it is inseparable from human nature to hope and fear. It is inseparable from human nature to hope and fear. Now, the way he's defining hope is when the market goes against you, you hope that every day will be the last day and you lose more than you should had you not listened to hope. And we've all been there at some point in our career, and possibly we revisit it more than we should sometimes, 
where we let a loser get away from us, and then we begin to end up in this trap. As I've said before, and I don't want to pick on, it might seem like I'm picking on one individual, but I've seen this throughout my career. I was in Hong Kong a couple years back, and somebody there was a very smart gentleman, asked a lot of questions, very smart, very friendly, nice guy. But the Hang Sing was down about 30% at that point in time, and so was he. And he kind of felt trapped like, well, he was hoping that the losses didn't get any worse, but he couldn't get out now because he was down so much. So it's a very bad place to find yourself in. And after a string of losers or a big losing trade or a big drawdown, then fear becomes even worse. And as Jesse, Jesse, Jesse Livermore, he tried to say, was defining fear as it relates to the normal fear in markets is when the market goes your way and you become fearful that the next day will take away your profit and you get out too soon. So his point is that if you're hoping with losses, you'll end up losing too much because you're hoping they don't get any worse. And if you're fearing with profits, then you're not going to make enough because you're going to fear that that profit is going to erode. So his point is that you should be hoping when you're fearing and fearing when you're hoping. And he went on to say that he, and he was referring to the successful trader, has to reverse what you might call his natural impulses. Instead of hoping, again, he must fear. And instead of fearing, he must hope. He must fear that his loss may develop into a bigger loss, and he must hope that his profit may become a big profit. Now, all of that is a fancy way of saying, cut thy losses short, and let thy profits ride. Now, that's easier said than done, and I'm going to flesh that out a little bit in a few seconds. One thing I was thinking about as I was going live is you do have to be careful with the cut the losses short part of this, and that's because that sort of has a suggestion that you, as soon as you have a loss, you got you got to get rid of it, and that's not true. You have two types of losses. One, you just have a flat-out loss, and then two, you have losses to the open profit. Well, let's talk about the flat-out loss first. A lot of times your timing won't be exactly right, or something will happen. And as Douglas once said, Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas, all it takes is one A-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. Well, it might not completely knock you out of the trade. In other words, you might not hit the stop. But that's not a reason to get out just because you have an immediate loss or a loss even after a few weeks or a few months for that matter. If you're following the plan, in longer term, your life's going to be a lot easier if you do follow the plan. And I'm going to get to that in just one second. But the point I'm trying to make with the losses is you have to be careful not to get out at the first signs of adversity. There's an old stock market adage, all shorts will go against you. Well, that seems to be true. I've never had a short that didn't seem to go against me, at least initially. But on a long side, too, a lot of times you'll get in a position and it'll trigger and then go against you for a while and then eventually take off. So when I say cut your losses short, that doesn't mean exit at the first signs of adversity. It means exit when your stop is hit, no questions asked. And I wrote an article years ago. I have to dig around the Internet for it. It wasn't on my website. It might have been back in the trading markets days, if memory serves. But the article was the myth of tight stops. And, and I think I probably went on to talk about, as I've said, ad nauseum, the popular methodology out there that suggests we should use an 8% stop. Well, that's suggest that's like saying we should all wear a medium-sized shirt, something my fat ass hasn't done. 
since I was maybe five years old. You have to adjust your stop to the volatility of the stock. We had one a while back, and I have plenty of articles on this, but we had one a while back that sticks out where we had a 34% stop. Now, that sounds kind of crazy, but if you look at the chart, let's see if I can just kind of draw it in here a little bit. The chart looks something like this. It was a bow tie and a first thrust. It looked something like this. You know, it was a longer-term downtrend like this. And then it was a little bit of a pullback. Well, the entry was here, and the stop was like right there. Well, if you look at the chart, that doesn't look too extreme, does it? Well, it just so happened that this was about an 80% move higher, and this was a pretty sizable retrace, and it bounced around 10-15% a day at least. So 34% might seem extreme, but when you look at the chart, it's not that big of a deal. And I've got that on the website. It's CNX is the stock that I'm, that's come to mind. So you need to flip that around and make it hope that your profits continue to grow. And by the way, I'm often asked how much is enough. It's never enough. Indeed, is 50% enough? No. Is 100% enough? No. Is 200% enough? No. You have to make as much as you can. Don't feel like you're being a greedy bastard because guess what? You're going to lose plenty along the way. And remember, your recovery from a drawdown has to be much, much, much bigger than the drawdown itself. In other words, let's say you lose 50%. Well, you got to make back what? 100%. If you lose 90%, you got to make back what? 9,000% or 900%. I forget the math on that. But it grows geometrically. So you have to make as much money as you can when you and i hate to use the word elusive and i do i do have a habit of making it sound too elusive but when you do get that outlier that elusive big winner comes along you have to squeeze it for everything it's worth and we'll talk about that in one second now and flipping the hope and fear around like livermore suggests and it's kind of interesting again i, I was listening to uh, a cd yesterday by Janice Dorn, who's done some work in psychology. I don't think she's she's with us anymore. God rest her soul. But she was saying the same thing. You should be hoping when you're fearing and fearing when you're hoping. So it's like the further you go back in time, the more you find this. And it's like even past Livermore, I found Selden, S-E-L-D-E-N. We talked about him in the last couple of weeks. Uh, he wrote a book. I think it's called Psychology, psychology of Trading. And there's a lot of good things in there that you also see in Livermore and other books. So Again, there's nothing new under the sun. But getting back to the fear and flipping the two around, you have to fear that your losses will grow. Well, you only have to fear past your stop and get out at your stop. I know, it's easier said than done. But that's what you do. So again, you want to change hope to fear and fear to hope. All right, so I think I kind of beat the dead horse on that. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to get the reps in. And as you know, I do a lot of studying of deliberate practice and, and these type of things. And I've, I've talked about it extensively, and there's a lot of articles on the website. So you do have to get a little experience in and as I wrote in my most recent article, I met a trader last year in Vegas at a conference, and he was depressed, and I thought that he'd been chipping away at it for a long time. And so I asked him, how long have you been trading? He's like, well, three weeks. It's like, you know, it's almost laughable, okay? He was a successful businessman and entrepreneur, and I guarantee you, it took him longer than three weeks to become a, a success. You don't become an instant success in anything overnight. And if you read Blink and Outlier and all of these um, Malcolm Gladwell books, and I forget the, the, the research he's, he's drawing on, and I, I should be better than that. But um, if you search 
on my website in Week in Charts, I, I did one where I talked about how uh, there's a rift between the guy who started the deliberate practice thing, the guy from Alabama. I forget his name. If somebody knows, let me know. Um, in, in Gladwell, and they're actually more in agreement than, they, than I think the two of them think they are. But you do have to put the reps in. You do have to put the hours in. And I didn't do the math this morning, but I've done it before. And I think I've looked at, last time I counted 10 million charts throughout my career, and that number's probably much bigger. And every time I do the math, it's like, well, it can't be that big. But then if I back it up a little bit, it's like, yes, it is. I probably looked at a few hundred charts this morning. Well, at least 300 this morning. And I look at upwards of 2,000 every night. Look at 250 sectors every night, uh, combination of sectors and ETFs. I look at up to 2,000 stocks every night. And then if you want to count twice, I'll actually go through that list twice one with a scan and one without. And with the scan, it eliminates about half to three quarters of the stock. So if you want to count repetitions, it goes even higher and higher. So the point is you will need some experience in the reading of the charts. And then you're going to have to get your reps in when it comes to your methodology. And I have an infographic here in a second, a little flow chart where we talk about that. And then if you look at the current article on my website, I guess I need to, um, let me give you the name of that in case a week from now it's no longer up there. It's there is no clear career path to becoming a trader. Oh, it's close enough. If you do a search on it, you'll find it. But in that searching process, you must be confident in your methodology. And once you get that confidence, and this is another reincurring theme of mine, is for just one trade, you can do it. Just do it for one trade. Once you prove that you could follow the process for just one trade, win, lose, or draw, then you have proved that you could do it. Now, the map is not the territory, and whatever that Telemann of Arcadia quote I have in the current column, I should have pulled that up. Uh, and I think that uh, paraphrasing him, it's like it's one thing to study war. It's another it's another thing to live the warrior's life. So you're going to have to experience some ups, some downs. And one thing that I didn't put in today's presentation is you're also going to have to experience some grinded out times. And if you read Market Wizards, and I think it was the first Market Wizards, Brian Gelber talked about the fact that sometimes you're hot, you're so hot, you can't sleep at night because you're printing money, and then sometimes you're cold, you're so cold, you can't hit the side of the barn, and then the rest of the time, you kind of grind it out. Win and lose, win and lose, win and lose, and it seems like more often than not, you're in this grind it out mode. So along those lines, you're going to have to learn what winning feels like. And at the last minute, I added in this mixed with losing. Because I've seen people print money and know what winning feels like and have it go to their head. It's, it's like I didn't mean to do it, but I seem to be just uh, <laughs> reading the article to you. I mean, if I can get if I'll pull it up, I'll show you where it is. But it has to be mixed with some losing, interspersed with some losing. And as I said in the article, I've seen people do a lot of stupid things like tell the boss to F off. Husband and wife teams quit a profitable business that they worked a long time to build because the trading is far more easier. They're following Big Dave's pullbacks in a bull market. Well, that's going to work pretty good, okay, until things get a little choppy. This is the article I'm referencing. There is no clear career path to becoming a trader, or is there? And if uh, you're watching this a month or a year from now, just type that into the search bar on my website, and it'll come up. And what was that reference from Telemon? It's in here somewhere. 
and get it right. It's one thing to study war and another to live the warrior's life. Telamon of Arcadia. So you have to experience the winning, but you can't let it go to your head. And, and I've been quite douchey before when I hit a really big winning streak. Back in 99, I was a cocky little shit for a while, at least. <laughs> But it's pride goeth before the fall, and it was a good lesson. And I think we all learned a lesson back then. So it does have to be tempered with a little losing. And by the way, I've had people who I'm amazed with, by the way, because they could do it. But they've come in to my trading service during a choppy market and mediocre markets, and they grinded it out. Lose, 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 win, win, lose, 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 win, win. And just grinded it out for months. And then when we get to the print money phase, when, not if, okay, when, the problem is I don't know when, when is. <laughs> like Livermore says, don't give me time and give me time. It takes time. But when they hit that print money phase, it doesn't go to their head, unlike the aforementioned people who said this trading thing is, is much easier than running a business. So I'm just going to scrap my business. You can do both. It's not mutually exclusive. In fact, as I preach without going off too far on a tangent, busy traders make good traders. The best traders I know have other careers. They go off and save lives, build buildings, repair tr transmissions, and they only trade when opportunities present themselves. Now, failing to win is a reoccurring theme I've been kind of noodling with over the last several months. And by that, I mean you have to be willing to lose on on any trade, there is a risk. You, there's no arguing that, okay? In spite of what some marketers might tell you. On any given trade, there is a risk, obviously. So that means on any given trade, there's a chance that you could be a loser on that trade. Now, Mark Douglas, getting back to Mark Douglas, he talked about a good salesman versus a bad salesman. It's similar to a good trader versus a bad trader. And I know I've told this a thousand times, but it's just such a great analogy. A good salesman will make several bad phone calls in a row, maybe spend all morning getting rejected. And he'll go get a big cup of coffee and he'll sit down and he'll say, okay, next. I'm getting closer to some winners here. If I keep chipping away at it, the laws of average will begin to play out. I know that out of 100 sales calls, I'm going to get whatever number it is, 10 clients. And if I've made 50 sales calls, then I know I'm getting closer and closer and closer to getting a client. The bad salesman goes out and drinks his lunch after he gets a string of bad calls. Now, by the way, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. If you don't have a positive expectation built into your methodology, if you don't have an edge, so to speak, then obviously you don't want to trade yourself into a, a huge hole. I mean, that's another conversation in and of itself, but we're, we're going to get to that at least on the peripheral, in just one second. So you have to be willing to lose to get to the winners. And then once you get to a winner, and this is the hope and fear, that's, that's where things get screwed up, is because I've seen it happen time and time again. And, and if you go back and watch some presentations, and I'll have to redo one soon, but earlier this year when things were looking pretty iffy, and the portfolio was beginning to erode, and I think we only had one or two winners left, somebody emailed me and said, Dave, everything's going to, to shit. 
uh, why not just lock in what little bit is left before it erodes? It's like, well, I hear you and I feel your pain. I feel your pain. But the longer term thing to do is to just follow the plan. And part of that following the plan is being willing to give up some of those open profits. And that's tough for many. And you've seen me do this quite a bit. But I like to take an open winner and look at the peaks and troughs. So you can see with this chem, within a few days, we're up about 6%, and then that 6% profit eroded to zero, and maybe even slightly negative, especially with commissions and such. I guess comm commissions are so negligible now, it doesn't matter, but just a little friction involved, obviously, in trading, slippage and such. And then it was up 78%. And you could see a sizable portion of that 78% was given up. It doesn't look like that much on the chart. But when you do the math, then you were only up 58%. So you made it to 111%, and then you were only up 80%. You made it to 119%, and then you were only up about 87%. Now, that number is bigger than the other one. I think that I might have taken that off the close as opposed to the low. So the low of that move would have been in the 70s. And here you're up 163%. And then you're only up 124%. Then you made it to 200% and changed, 214. And then that drew down to 181%. And there's 262%. And then that drew down to 181%. So it's tough giving up those open profits. But it comes to the territory. And I tried to find it before all my books are all messed up because I've got stacks and stacks that I've spread out throughout my office while working on this project. But I, I swore I would never read the turtle books. And I ended up reading Curtis Face book. And then I actually read his second book, Trading from the Gut, which I actually literally have right here in my hand. There's some good stuff in this book, too. Mr. Faith has had kind of an interesting life. So we don't want to necessarily follow everything that he says and does. But he does have some, some pretty good introspection when it comes to psychology of the market. And in the first turtle book that he wrote, or the turtle book, whatever, The Way of the Turtle, he talked about how Dennis treated open profits differently. And I just assume everybody knows who the turtles are. I and mean, I was actually talking to a client a couple of days ago, never heard of them. The turtles were Eckert, William Eckert and Richard Dennis were in a turtle farm somewhere in Japan or wherever, and there was thousands of little turtles. And they got into a little bit of a, of a debate on whether or not traders are made or born, born or made. And I don't know who said which was the other, but it's kind of like, as, as I've seen it described on the Internet before, it's like a trading places type of thing where they bet on that they can make a trader out of anyone. Same kind of thing, but with real money and real people. Anyway, they're in the Market Wizards book, and you can read about it. Um, I think it helped that they were in the right place at the right time. I think there was a commodity bull market around that time where breakout strategies work really well. Difficult to trade in that type of fashion on a pure basis in nowadays, but it is trend following, and a lot of the things I preach about or built into their system too. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late, but Dennis's point with the traders was that he treated open losses to open profits differently than flat out open losses. So if you had a loss and you should have gotten out of the trade, then he had a problem with that. But if you had a 262% profit like we have here, and that eroded down to 182, Provided, of course, your stop is further away from the market than that, which it is. Then he didn't have, he didn't seem to have a problem with it because that sort of comes with the territory. And a lot of, a lot of trading is just accepting what comes with the territory. And it, it goes against human nature. 
And you really, a lot of times, have to do the hard thing. And that's one of my epiphanies in more recent times and doing all this research is that, okay, now I know why I feel how I feel. Now I know why I'm so damn emotional because you can't make a decision without emotions. So trading is learning what comes with the territory. And I'm just kind of backing into this, but this might be fodder for a whole series or a whole whatever. It's just learning how to accept what comes with the territory. And it kind of reminds me of, um, I think it was Mike Moody was giving a speech to the AAPTA once and talking about relative strength and momentum. And I'm like, well, Mike, you know, my problem with it is after doing a lot of research and doing a lot of running a lot of little uh, model portfolios on just buying new highs and things like that is that it does really well and it prints money, but it always ends badly. And it's like, what do you do about that? And he's like, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. You know, babies are cool and nice to have, but they come with a lot of baby poop. So it's one of those things where it's just something that you have to learn to embrace. It comes with the territory. In the end, trend following ends badly. OK. The trend is your friend until the end, the bend of the end. Right. Anyway, I think I've digressed a little too far. The point is you have to be willing to give up some open profits and that can be hard especially when you're kind of grinding it out. And this year has been kind of a grinded out kind of year. It's, uh, I forget which year it was, 2013 or one of those years where the market ended up like double digits, but it wasn't like the market did this and then ended up here like that, okay? It was more like, like this, <laughs> you know, by the end of the year, yeah, it's up 13%. But there were a lot of gyrations along the way. Very hard for a trend follower to make money in that type of market. So let's take a look at the process. Obviously, you want to do your homework and your research and getting back to the, the Gladwells of the world. Your 10,000 hours. Well, there's a lot of debate on the 10,000 hour thing, but I think it's true. Ideally, you want to have about 10,000 hours under your belt. I could shorten that for you to maybe 100 hours or maybe an hour if you're willing to embrace and accept that there's no holy grail and follow something really super duper simple that makes sense conceptually and just follow that until you get it. And one thing I've been kind of noodling with while working on this psychology course is not that I, I suggest you should run out and trade Forex because it's a very hard way to make money. But in Forex, you could trade a very small account and there's no commissions and there's a little frictional cost and that's how they make their money. But you could trade a very, very small account and maybe follow a system that's somewhat mechanical and you're not doing this to, to get rich or make a lot of money. You're doing this to help you get those reps in and to follow the plan and the process. And I'm kind of noodling with that. I don't know if anything will come with it. But maybe something fairly mechanical like bow ties or maybe something even simpler like a, a daylight pattern. And just trade that to get used to trading it, to get the reps in, to get used to following a system. And again, you're not trying to get rich doing this. You're trying to get the reps down. You're trying to get the emotions down. You're trying to become very, I don't want to use the, mechan the word mechanical, very methodical in what you do. Now, getting back to the process, when you're doing your research, make sure it's something simple and conceptually correct. There's some numerology out there and some other crazy things that can work over periods of time. And by the way, usually it works when the market is trending, FYI. There's complex methods. As I've said before, I've seen people in presentations throw up a, a slide with 100 buy and sells. And usually, as I preach, they have a moving average plotted. And I've done plenty of slides on this. 
And usually something simple like a moving average will keep you in the majority of the trade. Okay? So instead of 100 buy and sell signals, it's like buy and sell is all you have to do. So make sure it's simple and conceptually correct. As I also wrote last week, what's interesting, my grail hunting has become this simplified thing where what's the simplest thing that I could do to prove that you could still capture a trend. And I actually did this back in the 90s. I actually did this back in 95 when I wrote initially about, it wasn't called that back then, but somebody read the article and, and dubbed it Daylight. So, and somebody recently called it Dave Light, which I like. And I just put a little system, simple system out there that just used Daylight to get you in the trends. And that's just a low greater than moving average or a high less than moving average for selling. So my grail hunting over the years has really morphed into how simple of a system can I make? And a lot of the, the Bruce Lee type of analogies come in, his philosophy on it's kind of like I don't fear the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So find something really simple that makes a lot of sense, get good at it, and become successful. And, and by the way, if you're not successful with something really simple, you're not going to be successful with something that's more complex because it's going to be much harder to follow. And if what you're doing isn't very simple and conceptually correct, if you can't explain it on a cocktail napkin, that I'm often talking about that cocktail napkin model, then you need to go back to the books. And by the way, don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good stuff that's already out there. Now, I've discovered quite a few things, and then I go back and look and say, well, somebody else was doing that long before me, so there's nothing new under the sun. But don't reinvent the wheel. I can give you a few things, persistent pullbacks, TKOs. You can get that off my website. It's straight out of the books. Just do that and become successful at that before venturing into something that's a little bit more complex. So keep doing that until you think you have something that's simple and conceptually correct. Now, by the way, by conceptually correct, I've discovered things back when I used to do a lot of crazy mechanical testing. I've discovered some things that printed money, but I couldn't figure out how it worked, a fat finger, some indicators or something, and I got into it, and it just didn't didn't make sense. And I doubt seriously that it would, would have continued to print money. Basically, what I did was accidentally curve fit my formulas to the prior datas, data. Now, once you have built confidence that you actually have something, then it's time to begin to execute. But if you don't have the confidence, go back to research. And again, I keep coming back to this article. My, I think the, the amount of time, uh, let me rewind that. How many, how many setups? Like find 100 setups. Find something that worked, but more importantly, find something that didn't. Okay, and Find something that would be an obvious one that looked great that just flat out didn't work. So you realize going into it that, hey, what I have isn't perfect. It's conceptually correct. It makes a lot of sense. But I know it's not perfect. And by the way, nothing is. So after you get that confidence, then you want to start doing your analysis, your daily analysis to find setups. And if you have confidence in your setup, if you really think you have a great looking setup, then we move to the next phase. But if not, go back to doing your analysis. It's okay not to have anything to do. And I'd probably make a lot more money if I just recommended a bunch of crappy stocks all the time as opposed to telling people to sit on your hands. I know I've told the story a thousand times, but Back in the trading markets days, they actually had salesmen that would market and they would call me up and say, Dave, you haven't recommended anything in a week. We're losing clients. You've got to start recommending something. 
And I'm like, well, there's nothing to do. I'm not going to do anything. I, I didn't let them bully me into recommending something. And the flip side of that was when I was recommending stocks and they weren't really working out, they really didn't lose clients. It's only when I told people to wait when we lost clients. So once you think you have something, now how do you have that confidence? Well, first of all, you you you, you did your 100 setups to begin with, okay, and you paper traded them. And again, paper trading and real trading, two different things. I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. But once you think you have confidence enough in the pattern, and once you think you found something, well, first of all, if it's a shipper, go in and see if there's any other shippers, any sexy sisters or sexy brothers, depends on what you're into, that look even better than your setup. And look at the overall sector and make sure the sector is trending or ideally trending and set up. And then, of course, look at the market unless you're trading something that's a little bit more commodity related, which can trade uh, irrespective of the of the market trend. But make sure the market is trending, too. And, and it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you'll get something like a persistent pullback in the overall market, a persistent pullback in the sector, a persistent pullback in an individual stock and other stocks within the sector. And when all those stars align, usually, not all the time, but usually you have a pretty darn good trade. And your chances of success are huge. So make sure as many pieces fit as possible. And then you have to do your planning. And it's amazing. I do all the planning ahead of time in my service. And people have the exact same information. And some people do amazingly well. And some people can't make it work. And they had the same exact information. I think it was in Market Wizards. Somebody wrote they could publish their system on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. wouldn't affect performance. And that's because people would still do whatever they wanted. And then psychology would rear its ugly head. Their hope, their fear, their greed would all come into play. And when that system hits a string of 10 losers in a row... These aren't his words. These are mine. I'm just hypothetically speaking here. But when it hits 10 losers in a row, more than likely they quit trading the system. Or if the system was longer term trend following, had a deep drawdown. When they hit that deep drawdown, they would likely bail out. Or they would hold on to a loser too long or cut their profit short, whatever the case may be. But in your planning, obviously, there's only four things you have to plan. Where are you going to enter? Where are you going to put a stop? what your initial profit would be, and that's just a calculation based on the first two, and then the trailing stop. There's a little discretion in the trailing stop, but that's just going to be the initial risk on a one-for-one -one basis early in the trade, and then you can let that widen out as the trade goes on. I know, all you got to do makes me, makes me nuts, as I've said a thousand times. My wife is like, well, why don't you just fix this little plumbing problem? You know, All you got to do is get a wrench and tighten up the pipe. You know, it's, uh, it's never that easy. Or at least it appears easier on the surface than it actually is. Now, your execution, you're going to do the same exact thing. And it's a process. And as I think I said last week or week before, you should know what you should do at all times. And if you don't know what you should do based on this entry stop, initial profit target trailing stop, you just simply ask yourself, and this is part of possibly deliberate practice, but ask yourself, if you knew what to do, what would you do? And as I've said before, that's that's really got me through life. And I think it's kind of like Anthony Robbins speak. He might be the first person where I heard that from. But it's true. When I was hired by a hedge fund and then a second hedge fund, got me from the first hedge fund, but it does. That's kind of a long story. I was kind of, I didn't know 
what I was going to do or what to do, but I would look at the charts and said, well, if I'm not sure what to do, what would I do if I knew what to do? And then I'd give them an answer, what I thought about the markets. And I'm not sure how it came up in conversation, but one time the hedge fund manager says, right or wrong, Dave's going to tell you what he thinks. What's the, uh, what's the old saying? Often wrong, but never in doubt. Well, you have to reach a point where you're unfortunately often wrong, but never in doubt. You have to have confidence in your system knowing that it will often be wrong. And again, that goes against human nature. That's another, or that's more fodder for another presentation. But his point was, you always know where you stand. And that was a, a, I was glad he said that because that helped me early in my career. And several other people have said the same thing about me. And I've put it in testimonials on the website, of course. And it's kind of interesting. They say he's not always right, but he's going to tell you where he stands. And if he's wrong, he's going to admit that he's wrong. And it's a very humbling thing to do. And the people that are, the people that are cocky or, or full of shit. <laughs> you know, I mean, what did I say recently or in the last uh, presentation? The, the false, how's it go? It came from the book called The War of Art. But basically, it said the real innovator is scared to death. And that's true. The longer I'm in this business, the, real, the more I realize how little control I have over the markets. I have no control over the markets, and that's a very humbling experience. Now, if there had to be one secret to trading, in addition to do your homework, get your reps in, make sure it's simple, do your analysis, make sure you find the best and left the rest, and remember, doing nothing is always a choice. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice, as the band on their 401k tour sings. But one of the secrets, if there is a secret, is a post-mortem. And not as much as I used to, and I don't feel like I'm beating a dead horse and all this, but sometimes you got to hear, you know, my wife, what do you think about McCollum? You say the same shit over and over. It's like, yeah, I'm going to keep saying the same shit until you people get it. And that's and that goes back to the same thing happened with, uh, that's a, the preacher in one of the Anthony Robbins stories, the preacher kept saying the same thing each week. And the parishioner was like, hey, preacher, I hate to say this to you, but you keep saying the same thing. Well, that's why I beat the dead horse so much, because I see so many problems out there. And I wrestle myself with a lot of these things. And I've got to keep reminding myself to do the hard thing. But a postmortem is really going to help you out. Go in and you back that chart out to day one when you first saw the trade. And was it really trending? Was it really in a persistent trend? Or if you're trading something like a bow tie or a first thrust coming off a major low, did it really look like a major transition and trend was in the works? And getting back to the trend itself, if you're trading like a generic pullback, was there acceleration in trend? Did the stock look like electric cardiogram? Was there overhead resistance? Now, it took me 14 hours to cover the whole subject of stock selection, but if you go in and watch the the one-hour video that I did there, these things that I just said are all in that one little video, and that's going to get you a long ways towards your proper stock selection. And if you don't believe me, watch as many charts, weak charts as you can stand. Just don't operate heavy machinery after. And you'll see how many stocks are asked about that have so many of these little problems that are easy to recognize after you put the reps in, of course, such as net net. OK, somebody will say, hey, Dave, what about this stock? Well, let's see. It's at twenty dollars a share. Let's go back six months. It was at twenty dollars a share. It made absolutely no progress. So there's no trend to follow there in order to have in order to trend follow. You must first have a trend to follow. Write that down. So through your postmortem, ask yourself all these tough questions. And if you feel so inclined, and I would strongly urge you to do this, go in and look to see if you could have found something better, even better. Okay, if you're in an energy stock, 
go through every single tradable energy stock and see if there's one that actually looked better than what you picked. And again, this is, comes back to that deliberate practice. Don't just put the reps in, work better at getting better. And every now and then, I don't do it as much as I used to, but every now and then, I'll say, what the hell was I thinking? In fact, I think that's when you reach that point where you say, what the hell was I thinking? That's when you're beginning to get it because you're beginning to recognize that you put yourself into a crappy setup to begin with. Now, your next level will be when you say, well, you know what? That was a damn good looking setup. If I saw that tomorrow or tonight even, I would take it. I would take it again. Even though, let's say you failed miserably on a setup. When you reach a point where you could say, what the hell was I thinking? And then number two, well, you know what? That looks pretty damn good. As Odin said, outcomes are noisy. And that's another hard thing to recognize. Sometimes shitty trades could have great outcomes. And sometimes great trades can have shitty outcomes. Great looking setups, I should say. So do the postmortem, and this is where you have to be brutally honest. And it's not easy for us to be honest sometimes, or all the time, that is. You know, it's always tough to do that introspection. And once you're done with the postmortem, then you go back to work. Do your analysis again. All right. Lots of questions coming up. Mark says I'm ripped. Thank you, Mark. I am down 30 pounds, so I got to I got to hit the weights now to fill up the flab. Gordon Gecko says greed is good. Greed is good. Okay. You got to be greedy when you get a winner. And one thing that that I'm going to flesh out more and more. And I was lucky early on. I had a broker. I was thinking about this when I was grabbing a cup of water right before the uh, show. My futures broker early on, when when he was younger, he did a study of millionaires as, as kind of like a young punk kid. And he actually interviewed one of the market wizards long before market wizards ever existed, the book that is. And he learned a lot from him when it comes to trend following and, and, and all these different things. And one thing they learned was make it a game. Games are fun. Trading is hard. Trading is hard mentally. It's, hard. it's just hard. But if you make it a game, it can be fun. I, I play a game called how long can I ride the winner and make it a game. See how long... You can ride that winner. Now, don't do something stupid like throw caution to the wind and not use stops. That's how a lot of people sell systems. Oh, it, it does great. Just, but don't use stops. Stops are bad for profits. Well, eventually you have to stop out. But make it a game. Make it a game like how long can I stay with this trade? Okay. So far we made it how many months? Oh, geez, we're in September. So we're about seven, eight months Eight months. We're eight months into a trade. I want to see if we can go three or four years. Okay. So make it a game. And remember earlier this year, back in January, maybe we'll be talking about this six months from now. Hopefully we'll talk about six years from now. So make it a game. Have some fun. Craig says, so it's 10,000 hours of experience or $40,000 in losses. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be $40,000 in losses. Because you can trade it at a size that's almost meaningless. And that's the hard part is following the process. The money won't come right away. The money comes on its own time frame. And that's really, really tough. But if you're following the process and you have a well-defined process and it's conceptually correct, the money will come. So you don't have to lose the $40,000, but yes, we've all lost. Those of us who have been around the block a time or two and tried everything in the world have lost a substantial amount of money. Yeah, 40000 would be nice. Just lose 40000 <laughs> With solid money management, trade management, and proper position sizing, how long years a month does it usually take for a compounding to start taking effect 
on account of any size based on your experience. You know, that's one of those, it's, it depends. And I hate those type of answers. But if you understand trend following and you or risky 2% per trade, picking the best, leaving the rest, and all those other cliches, and you are following along and you're in good markets, you could be profitable from day one. And that's the problem that I've seen is the people who are profitable from day one don't make it longer term. A friend of mine used to travel the world chasing volatility. He's an options trader. And he found himself in India for a while and he would hire these Indian traders. And he once told me, he said, Dave, I like the new guys that have their ass handed to them right away. He likes the new guys to just get clobbered even though it's his money on the line he likes a new guy to get clobbered and have him come in white face to his office scared shitless you know because those guys they have a trial by fire when it comes to risk and they fear for losing their job and they learn very quickly to respect the risk the guys that come in when the market is trending or whatever he was doing, the volatility was such or whatever, and print money, they don't know what happens when that bad string of losses or big loss comes along. So I would say it depends, but I think if you, if you're win, lose, win, lose, win, lose, grinding it out and following the process, then I think you're getting closer and it might take a while of doing that but I would say I mean if you're following along like if you're following along with with my service hopefully and I use the word hope and I know I shouldn't say hope but hopefully within a year you'll go through a complete cycle to where you get into a good momentum cycle and you'll get back to the print money phase question on post-mortem back testing thoughts Back testing has its purpose, but I think the use and over overuse and abuse of back testing is problematic at best. And that's why, as I've said at nauseam, I used to wake up a couple hours early and program systems for two or three hours every day, religiously. And then at the end of the day, before I'd go home, I'd program some more. And usually by the end of the day, I'd have two or three new systems. If you back test enough, you will eventually find the Holy Grail. Now, let me give you a, a caveat to that. That Holy Grail you found was a Holy Grail, was a historical Holy Grail. That's a good way of putting it. You have found a historical Holy Grail. In other words, you've curve fit. You've properly curve fit your systems of the markets. And I would never throw anybody under the bus, but I've seen people do some pretty shady things in system development. I've seen people have systems that have a really bad loss in the middle of the system, and then they'll say, well, throw a moving average in there, Dave, and that'll get rid of that short side trade, and then now we have this great system that makes all this money because you sweep that one loss under the rug. So you got to be really careful in the back testing. Now, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't have wasted all the time time and effort and money back testing, but that probably was necessary for me to realize there is no holy grail and to keep it simple and to just become a trend following moron as opposed to being a perpetual grail chaser. So you could you could do that. You could back test, but just be careful and, and kind of use it as a ancillary information. Case in point, a few years back, I decided to fire up the computers and do some back testing. And I discovered that educational stocks and shipping stocks are the worst trending stocks out there. So when I see an educational stock or a shipping stock now, I'm thinking, OK, well, I need to make sure I really like the setup. Not that they can't take off and not that I won't trade shippers. You can go back and look at the service archives and see some shippers in there and possibly even some educational stocks. But it's something that I learned that, well, they don't trade as good as some of these other areas do. Okay, so 
just use it as kind of like ancillary backup information and not not a holy grail. I, as I also wrote in that article, keep references. I once, I once told a system designer that his biggest drawdown is always in front of him as a mechanical system designer, and he began to scream at me. Well, I think, I think he's a little delusional for not recognizing that. If you're curve fitting something to the past, trust me, that future curve won't look exactly like that past curve. You know, what's amazing, and, and I don't want to digress too far. I know too late, but I've seen people do analogs, which is the stupidest thing in stupid town. And that's my opinion. I could be wrong, as Dennis Miller often says. But they'll take like a crude chart from the 50s or whatever, and they'll overlay it into current day S&P, like, like, and that's going to keep doing what it does. And it's just... It's just stupid, okay? If it's not conceptually correct, then please toss it out of the window. Congratulations, weight loss. It's absolutely great. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it kind of slow. Doing a little uh, Tim Ferriss, four-hour body. Doing a lot of uh, spinning. We've got a spin bike in the house. So you don't believe in back testing? Well, I spent years and years and years of back testing. So... It's kind of like by doing all that, I, I became anti-back testing. But play around with it, you know, if you're going to do the research. I would much rather have you back testing systems as opposed to trying to make something happen in the market. So, yeah, if you board the markets, go in and back test. I don't do it anymore. Um, not that I never would back test something. I've, I've, I've looked at a few things recently, and I've thought maybe I'll have this – program for me because I don't want to sit because I know myself if I start I can program but if I start programming something I'm going to get bogged down in it and before you know it I'm going to be off on a tangent ADHD or OCD I'm not sure which one but will have me off on a tangent that I shouldn't be on so been there done there I got the t-shirt do you have a percent ROI at all or is that a futile outlook uh, Russ, I think you answered your own question on that one. Good question. And, you know, I was thinking that's another thing I was thinking about right before I came live. It's like when I hit a drawdown in my trading, my wife will ask me, well, how are you going to recover? How long is it going to take to recover? I have no idea. Now, if you did some system testing, you're like, well, you know, it takes usually takes 200 days to recover, 100 days to recover. Well, there's no guarantee that the future will be like the past. The thing is, all you need is one or two big trades, but you don't know when those one or two big trades are going to come along. So, yeah, I think I think that all these numbers, you might as well just throw them out the window. Here's the thing you should always come back to. Number one, markets are not normally distributed. Okay? And that's just a fancy way of saying they don't adhere to pure statistics. If they did, whoever had the fastest computer or knew the most about statistics would be the richest guy, okay? They don't adhere to statistics. If you look at the casino industry, which is a multi-trillion, with a T, dollar industry, and I'm not talking about a slot machine or video poker or something like that. I'm talking about the, the table games. In a lot of cases, their edge is like a half of a percent. Very, very, very tiny edge that they have. But it's a multi-trillion dollar industry because you can define that edge. And that's why you can consistently make money if you're a casino operator because you know what that edge is. You might have a string of losses. It might come in a streak where you lose for a while, but eventually you're going to get back to that winning streak, and that's guaranteed. But because markets aren't normally distributed, you don't know when that next winner is coming along. Now, here's the weird thing. It's like they come along just enough and just the right time. But I can't, I can't define that. And that's why I try not to share with my wife when I'm in a bad drawdown. She knows it, though. She can tell. Because she always asks, well, how are you going to recover? When, how long will it take? I have no idea. And if anybody tells you differently, then they're, they're full of it. 
Let the market lead the way, I suppose. Yeah, good uh, good thoughts for us. Take what it gives you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, quick little money management thing. Last week we talked about that you wanted to not look a gift horse in the mouth. And this was a trade. This is our, uh, that was our entry. And you can see it, it hit the entry. If I can get the pen to work. So it went through the entry. And then it rallied up and came really, really close within cents of the initial profit target. Now, without giving you all of last week's lesson, which you can go in and watch on YouTube or my website under videos, actually. The point is that we're looking to make 1% on the account on this, which on 100K would be $1,000. And then we're looking to make uh, a million percent on this. So this is 1%. And then we hope to make a million percent on this. We want to make as much money as possible. So the point I'm making is the real money is here. But sometimes the market will rally up and then come right back in. This is all you get. I mean, sometimes you'll get a loss too. But sometimes it's all you get. At least you get that swing trade out. Better than poking the eye is what I call that. So when it gets really, really, really close within spitting distance, squint your eyes and or blur your eyes out. It looks like it's there. That's close enough. Now, like I said last week, don't take a, a $500 profit when you're looking for 1000 but if you're up around $950 or something, don't split hairs. Be willing to take that partial profit because a lot of times it might just barely get to it and not even touch it and then implode. And this is especially true if it kind of makes a beeline straight for it. And then luckily, or fortunately, I should say, I know you're not supposed to use the word luck, but fortunately, as you can see, we did hit that initial profit target right there. Now, to those new to the methodology, we do trail this, stop, kind of stair step it initially, and then once you hit the initial prof profit target, you bring it up intraday to break even. Now, this is a wonderful position to be in because barring overnight gaps, you have a free position. So what you need to do now is forget about this position and go out and find a new position and do the same thing, rinse and repeat. And that's the secret to making money in the market is to establish as many free positions as possible and then let them run. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about winter is coming and then it looks like it's been delayed. It took me forever to get around to watching Game of Thrones, but I did. And it's, um, it's kind of fun. A lot of good little quotes and stuff. That bastard Jon Snow especially has been saying, winter is coming. And if you watch them all, it, winter, winter did eventually show up. But right now I think winter is, is delayed. And the reason that I did these winter is coming speeches is because, one, the market was showing some signs. And more importantly, two, I wanted to get in front of it. So you would see the signals and see it all setting up. And if it didn't happen as it looked like it was a few weeks ago, then at least the next time these signals begin to set up and things begin to deteriorate, you would see it. Now, one thing that I've preached throughout, in fact, we didn't put on, here's the, here's the backup to wait as a trend follower, and you might be a little late, is that we didn't put on one short when I began worrying about the market. The short that we did put on was actually after the market began to improve again. So you don't want to go crazy and flip that bull bear switch like I often write about and paint yourself into a corner. You're like, okay, I'm a long-term trend follower. We're still in a longer-term trend. Aha, we're losing some steam on the daily. The Russell 2000s are bow tied down. Maybe I better pull my horns in a little bit. Maybe I better watch for some shorts. Maybe I better honor my stops and my longs. But I'm not going to make a drastic decision. Because sometimes 
what appears to be a new trend developing, an emerging trend or a trend transition, however you want to look at it, could only be a correction in a longer term trend. I guess I need to take this slide out, but <laughs> trading full circle is now available. You can watch the base videos there for free. If you go to the link, daylander.com, 2-trade-stocks-successfully, or you can click on that little um, link that looks something like this on my homepage to get those videos. All right, I don't think there's anything really new to announce this week. All right, let's hop into the charts, and I'm going to start with the overall market and I want to drill down into a few sectors. And then if you guys want to start asking about individual issues, feel free to start doing that now. All right, let's take a look at the P's. And then we'll take a look at the NASDAQ. Then we'll take a look at the Russell 2000. Craig, that's in the Landry list, I believe, so we can't talk about that one, but good eye, high five. All right, let's take a look at the piece. Now, yesterday was kind of interesting. They sold off fairly hard, but by the end of the day, they recovered to close well and in a plus column. That's an outside day up. So that's kind of interesting. Today, obviously, no follow through. One concern that I have, and believe me, it's a trend guy. I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to argue with new highs, okay? I lost my ego a long time ago and started calling myself a trend-following moron, right? Actually, somebody else called me that first. And initially, I didn't like it and was very depressed about it because it's somebody I knew, somebody I respected, somebody who weeks earlier was singing my praises. But then they got heavily short in the market that was going straight up. And all of a sudden, I was the moron for following the trend. But that's another story, and I digress. But one thing that concerns me, obviously, we've had this drift in here. I don't like a market that drifts. I like a market to accelerate and then pull back. And it's beginning to wedge a little bit. I'm not a big fan of wedges, unless a wedge looks like this. You've got a nice trend. And you have like a bull flag or something that looks like that, going back to Schaubach, Edwards and McGee, all that classical John Murphy, technical analysis. It won't let me draw it. Anyway, you get the idea. The flag should go down and not up. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but drifting action just means there's no acceleration, there's no new buying, or I should say demand. There's no new demand coming in the market because no new buying and selling, that kind of mucks things up a little but you can see we're just right off of all time high so no need to argue with that uh what's interesting a lot of people worried about this market and the more people that are worried about it the longer it'll continue to go higher so that's a good thing that's hard to quantify though you know your litmus test is could you trade off of it always ask yourself could you trade off of it and like people have these sentiment numbers oh bullish sentiments at 98 percent it's like well guess what at new highs it's always going to be at its highest level because everybody is happy. So you can't trade off of it. So throw it out, toss it out. But so far, so good. Again, ideally, I'd like to see this market accelerate higher, not look back for a while, get past these prior peak in here, and then have some orderly pullbacks along the way and healthy corrections. So I would like to see some acceleration. I guess you can't have everything. Where would you put it? Right? With a W. Stephen Wright. Now, is that getting whacked a little bit today? Off its worst levels, like it did yesterday. So this market, it seems very resilient. And so far, so good. Except that I would like to see it get past its prior peak and not look back for a while. Now, it's a little bit more exacerbated in the Russell 2000 the peak stands out a little bit more, and we're right at it. In fact, we're right at all-time highs right now. So that's a good thing. I'm not going to argue with it. My only problem is by the time the market gets all the way back to its prior highs, 
with these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, it's already overbought. So it's kind of hard for the market to mount a new leg on top of the old leg, but sometimes stranger things have happened. And I'm not going to argue with the market at new highs. Now, some areas have recently been at or near new highs, as you would expect. Chemicals, for instance. The energies are looking pretty interesting now. I, I was not a big fan of the energies up until recently because I prefer two things. One, transitional setups, setups coming off of major highs and major lows like 2014 and 2016, as opposed to these mid-trend type of setups. And two, I like markets that are in solid trends like it was here and here and here, okay? But when it's in kind of this wide and loose longer-term sideways range, I'm not as excited about them. But the good news is they are improving as of late and has been fairly persistent. And I am beginning to see some Phoenix type of setups, or at least Phoenix type of action. By that, I mean some of these energy stocks have sold off really hard, and they're beginning to bottom out. For instance, they're beginning to look at something like look like something like this. If you look to the, if you go through the sector, a lot of the energy stocks are beginning to look like this, and they bottomed out. And now they've been scrape bottom and then come on up. And we could see cup and handles, and I don't know if the, I don't know if I'm too far down the screen. Something like this, we're getting to rally off those lows. Let me let me try one more time. Like that, okay. So by Phoenix, I mean they they're kind of rising from the ashes. They bottomed out. They've got all the bad news behind them. They're beginning to get their act together and rally off the lows. All right. A couple of more sectors in here, then we'll hop into the individual charts. The banks have come back from the dead, which is kind of phenomenal in here if you think about it. And they're banging out new highs. They were just like a bow tie recently. This is why I was very concerned about them not too long ago. We didn't go crazy on the short side. We didn't take any shorts. But... We were believing in what we saw, believing what you see, not in what you believe. All isn't rosy in the world. Some areas are getting whacked in here, like the foods. Health services also recently got whacked. So as I preach, it's kind of a game of clues. you got to keep watching to see if more and more areas join in the fray. The good news is some areas like manufacturing, banging out new highs in here. Okay, very overbought, but so what? I'm not going to argue with new highs. Transports have come back from the dead. And look at that, not too far from all-time high, so that's certainly a good thing. Semiconductors got whacked a little yesterday, but they could use a pullback. This is the breakout I like to see, followed by an orderly pullback, and I think, or a TKO or something would be great there. Getting back to the banks, financials in general have been doing fairly well. Take a look at financials right now, today. Not too far from these new highs, so that's certainly a good thing. So overall, it's looking pretty good. But yeah, there's some mixed action still here and there. Charles, that's on my list for today. Good eye. Fantastic eye. Donald, that's on my list for today. Good eye. <laughs> Very. Still kicking myself for missing this IPO first thrust bow tie. Let's take a look at it. That's going to be a uh, – that's actually – I was looking at this one too. This is a – this is a really good example of an IPO breakout. Now, I'm not a big breakout fan, but I am a fan of breakouts and IPOs. And I have one pattern that just buys simply at new highs. And then another pattern, if you take a look at a five-day moving average, and I call it the uh, – I don't have an official name for it, but I've got to put my, my – my wife said I have to put my name in the next pattern I create, like John Bollinger did with his Bollinger Bands. So this would have actually been a buy the first day it broke away from its moving average and closed at a new high, which would have been like right in here somewhere. But yeah, the IPOs, I started today's, I started out doing research this morning on the IPOs of the last 100 days. And one thing that I'm kind of fascinated with is the dichotomy that still exists in more recent times. 
these things either fly or they die, as I preached about years ago in the course. Jeez, it's been over a year or two years. Let's see if we could find the one. Um, and it was chicken soup stock, which I was looking at this morning. And that's the beauty of the IPOs. And if you need a promo code, I'll give you a promo code if you want the course. I'll make you a really good deal. I need to put it on sale again. Eventually, by the way, anything, as I usually say, anything that I show, anything I said the course will eventually, in the old courses, will eventually go to the new courses. Where Meaning that I'll, I'll do the green screen and make them a little bit more professional and then add quizzes and all the other stuff. The stuff that you're seeing in Trading Full Circle, that's the ultimate goal is to upgrade everything to that. The the data are the setups are going to be pretty much the same. There's not a whole lot new, but the presentation is going to be much better. And once you get a course, it's yours for life, and you also get uh, unlimited lifetime support, within reason, obviously. A lot of that support is going to be, all right, you didn't watch it, but the good news is we have a... Um, learning management system now so we could track it here it is chicken soup for the soul see this is the kind of thing that i've been seeing lately this is what i talked about a couple of years ago in the course and what's cool now is dichotomy has really taken charge and there's so many ipos blue apron snap this chicken soup thing oh that's not it blue apron that have just absolutely imploded. But the good news is by following a simple system, even just a breakout system that I like in IPOs or first pullbacks, if you prefer to trade that, would have kept you out of a lot of trouble. No capital would be put into harm's way on a lot of these setups. On OC. Um, yeah, this is a TKO. Uh, it's not a, it's not a huge TKO. I like something. Let's see if I can give you a good example here. I like something that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. It's not a great example here, but it, it needs to be. Let me see if I can find you one. No, it's too far back in time. It's one of these stocks in here. Um, the other thing, too, is look at the HV on this. It's got an HV of 21, which is pretty low. I like an HV. For shorting, it's a different different story. I, I tend to short more efficient stocks, but I tend to like a little bit higher HV if you're trading momentum. I mean, it's okay. Okay, I certainly can't fault you for that. you got a gap down. you got brand new highs. I do like the fact that it made this this close way up here to the high, and then all of a sudden began to implode. I call it an arbalist TKO, which is kind of a stupid name, but for lack of a better name, an arbalist is like a bow and arrow times 10 pull back. And sometimes when the market gets pulled down in this way, it shoots right back up, and that's why I thought about it. So I'm going to give you an okay on that. I just would have liked to have seen more knockout move. This is only a couple point knockout move in a 70 something dollar stock. So, yeah, to answer your question, yes, but not got moved, not enough. Uh, GTHS bought the recent pullback. Uh, it looks kind of thin. Oh, this is, uh, this is bad data. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. All right, so that's bad data, so let's ignore that. Yeah, it looks okay. Uh, thin, 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 too thin. And ideally, you want to see a little bit deeper pullback. I know in IPO, sometimes you can be a little bit more lenient. I can't falter for that one, Howard, but it's it's okay. Donna wants to talk about rig. But, yeah, if you didn't take the trade, let this pull back further. This is why you're not seeing that. Plus, it's also thin. Yeah, rig is, is somewhat of that Phoenix strategy or whatever you want to call it. Um, I would prefer if it looked – like this, as opposed to going down and then basing and then coming up and then basing and then basing down here. So I would dig through the energies and see if you could find something that's coming off of lows a little bit better 
as opposed to that. I'm trying to think of one in my head. It starts with a C, and it, it could set up really soon. I can't think of it. It escapes me at the moment. Zag. Zag is that Zag? Is it two Z's? Two G's? Yeah. Um, this one looks okay. It needs more of a pullback based on the run that it had. But yeah, certainly a nice momentum stock. I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback, maybe to about 13 or so. But yeah, good eye on that one. Put it on your momentum list. I've been watching it. All right, Cliff wants to know about OKTA. OKTA, that's going to be an IPO, I think. Um, yeah, it needs a little bit more pullback. It's kind of wide and loose. Uh, but it's okay. I, I don't like this this wide range bar all over the place. I would prefer this one if it broke out to all time highs and then pull back. So be careful on that one. But maybe put it on your watch list. John wants to know about MCHP. It's going to be a semiconductor, I think. Uh, yeah, it looks good. Uh, I would prefer if it would have cleared this prior peak more decisively. But that's what a TKO should look like, guys. So if this was a little further up from this prior peak and it cleared it decisively and you saw a TKO move like that, then I would say yes. A little bit on the low HV side, down around 21, and the volume, a little high on the volume. It's okay. But maybe dig a little deeper within your semiconductors to see if you can find something else. Cost. To me, the weekly looks decent, but daily is questionable thoughts. So let's take a look at that. I trade only off the daily charts. I do look at weeklies on occasion. And weeklies can give you powerful signals. Uh, the weekly is kind of all over the place, too. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Kind of a Jackie Mason stock. Um, when you have sectors like the semiconductors that are trending nicely and a lot of other sectors banging out new highs, I would avoid something like this because it's just kind of all over the place. You got these big gap downs and all. I, I think you could probably find something less wide and loose, like a couple of ones we already talked about. Oh, you're welcome, Russ, anytime. CLR. That might have been the one I'm thinking about. Nope, that's not it. It's okay, but notice how I've got this big arrow back here, 2016. So I would be more excited about the energies that are bottoming out like that as opposed to these mid-level energies. Karsten wants to know about SQM. Good to see you. How was that trading full circle course? Did you get through the whole thing? Be honest, because I can look it up and see. I can see where you are. See how you pass your quizzes. Yeah, this looks good. It needs more of a knockout. But look, what was I preaching earlier? Persistency. Look at that. Tends to go up day after day after day after day after day. Tends to have an orderly correction. Tends to go up day after day after day. Notice that it's got a little acceleration and it's trended here. So, yeah, high five, except it needs a pullback, okay, I, in a knockout ideally down below 55, maybe even as far as 50 or so on that would, would really be nice. What is my email address? I'd like to inquire about the trading full circle and trading service. Dave at DaveLander.com, Charles, and uh, thank you very much. Everybody's going to think he's a shill. No. I'll make you a good deal on everything. IOTS. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Kind of a little bit on the thin side, but still a relatively new issue. This is the longer term pattern where they just kind of come public, die, get their act together and take off again. But yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, kind of like to see how it shakes out by the end of the day. Maybe a little bit more knockout on that one. But, yeah, definitely put it on your momentum list for sure. CRC I'm probably not going to like. That's a big, thick Don stock. Oh, looking pretty good. Is that the one we're talking about? Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. It is thick, but that's okay. Um, it looks a little bit better than that prior one we're looking at. You can see we're down here towards not exactly all-time lows, but multi-year lows. So, yeah, this is a little bit better looking stock. We might be able to find even better in the energies, but certainly coming off the lows very nicely. Uh, possible pullbacks along the way, not too much overhead supply. So that looks like a stock that's definitely turning the corner. JBHT is going to be a trucking stock. JB Hunt. 
Uh, breaking out to brand new highs. It's back to chart out a little bit. Yeah, not bad. I prefer if it was clearing his prior peak decisively. It's a little wide and loose longer term. I would probably pass. Just thinking there's probably something a little bit more obscure out there that might have a better opportunity. Like an IPO or something, or maybe one of these energies bottoming out soon. But yeah, not bad. TFC was great. I'm now through stock selection and watching older week of charts nearly every day, getting better every day. Oh, thank you. That's music to my ears. I, I guess that's kind of like uh, fishing for a compliment. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, yeah, that broke my heart if you just said that. Kind of thin, so be careful with this one, but it is still a relatively new issue. Yeah, on a knockout move, absolutely. But you need to have some sort of pullback or knockout. Put that on your momentum list for sure, Steve. Good eye on that. IOTS. That sounds like a new issue. Yeah, it's trending. Did we talk about that? Yeah, we just talked about that one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, TKO. SIEN. We're almost out of time. Yeah, this looks good. Put it in your momentum list on a pullback, possibly. It needs to be a little bit deeper in the pullback. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, longer term, it's got some issues that might that might push me to look a little harder. Carson said the truth and nothing but the truth. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I, you know, you put stuff out there and you just don't know how it's going to be received. But yeah, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into that one. I never dreamed it'd be that hard. Yeah, this is a good looking uh, bottoming energy stock. I agree. Who said that? Uh, Donald, the other Donald. It's amazing the amount of percentage wise, we have more Donalds than uh, anything. Donalds and Dons in this group. <laughs> yeah, that looks good. Uh, maybe on a, a, it's probably bow tied. Yeah, you got the bow tied. Now you just need a little knockout bar. See, this is the Phoenix type of thing I was talking about. If you're doing the methodology, don't go out and trade these uh, Phoenix bow ties and things like that. Learn how to trade trends first. But yeah, it looks pretty good on a, on a little bit of a pullback. On the tiniest of pullbacks, that might be worth a shot. If you're not familiar with bow ties, get the free report on that. VNTR on the list. I guess too late if it is. <laughs> yeah, it needs a, a little bit of knockout in here. Uh, you know, it, it really hasn't made a huge move for an IPO. It's only five points from the from the low to the high. So I would almost want to wait for a secondary type of setup. I mean, it looks okay. You could certainly do a lot worse. Nice webinar, IOTS. Oh, yeah, we just covered that one, too. PBYI. We got time, just one or two more. No, I uh, noticed that um, it just barely got above its prior little peak in here. It's just kind of funky looking. Notice it kind of took off to the races here, and then it's kind of wide and loose. If it continues to trend, maybe on a pullback. But in IPO, you know, in biotechnology, you got IPOs out there looking pretty good. I would look I would look in IPOs. Maybe, you know, I'm already long this one, but something like AKCA, maybe on the next pullback, might be worth a shot. TRMR. Looks good. Uh, it needs a little bit more pullback, but, yeah, it looks pretty good. Maybe it pull back to, let's say, below 340. It'd be worth a shot. And then also, uh, and longer term, it's got some issues, but that's a long, long ways away. I give this one a strong maybe. I'd have to really think about the. The only problem is markets sometimes have long memories and people have bought way back here. Might be looking to get out of break even. But sometimes the more recent action can trump all that. But yeah, it looks pretty darn good. If I was just seeing this part of this chart, and then you know that CYRX is one of those charts that didn't look so great long, long term, but shorter term, it looked pretty darn good. I mean, this is a beautiful persistent pullback. It needs a little bit deeper pullback, though, for my taste. But, yeah, a good eye on that one. A high five. Dave, you seem to give more high fives to people who are clients. Well, because they're smarter. They know what they're doing. Yeah, this looks pretty good as a, as a Phoenix type of stock bottoming out. It's not set up just yet. But I hear you. It's a little on the thin side given the price of it, but not bad. Um, I prefer if this bottom was down, you know, I'm kind of picking it apart, but I guess if it was down towards this low here, I'd be more excited about it. I think that if you go through the energies, 
you could find some energies that are closer to uh, longer term lows. And John, we'll do that one and we'll have to wrap it up. REDA. Uh, yeah, it looks like uh, this was left over from last week. A lot of overhead resistance going back in time. So here's the thing. Uh, electronics wholesale, I don't know if that would be considered a semiconductor. But with the semiconductors just off of all-time highs, I think you could probably find something that has a little clearer air above. So I think I would go out and look for that first. Exhaust all other possibilities first before coming back to this one. Well, look, we're actually way past time. I know I pontificated a little too long. But um, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Any unanswered questions, he tried to say, David, Dave, Landry.com. If we don't talk again between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next Thursday. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Russ and Joe and Howard and Charles and Peter, uh, all you guys and girls. I'm, I'm humbled. Thank you so much.